So thank you very much, everyone, for being here this evening. This is AONM's second webinar during Lyme Awareness Month, and we're very proud and delighted to have with us two wonderful speakers. We have had them before. You may have um, heard both of them speaking just a little while ago about um, Toxiplex. And um, first of all, I'll introduce Professor Gilbert. She's going to be the first speaker on scientific evidence to support the use of phytochemicals in Lyme borreliosis. Professor Gilbert is the adjunct professor of cell and molecular biology at um, a distinguished university and um, the CEO of Tested Oi, a university spin-off company that is aimed at um, testing patients so that they can be treated and recover quicker. She has over 20 years experience in research-driven initiatives that provide valuable tools for patients. She has a doctorate in biotechnology and very long experience in bio-innovation and bio-business. So anything else I'll leave to her to introduce um, herself. Uh, so she has a very, very long CV. And um, Marcus Berger here is the CEO of Phytobox, which is a company he started together with a, a team in Germany. And I'll explain why in a minute. He studied sports economics and nutritional science in Leipzig in Germany and began working with Lyme patients um, as early as 2010 at a large clinic in Germany. And in 2012, um, began working on rehab training and giving consultations at another clinic in Augsburg. He also supports Armin Labs in the field of logistics and sample transport. And Phytobox is a company that he initially began because of noticing the need for specific, uh, very pure herbal supplements to support his own patients. And then that turned into a company that's now international. So um, Leona will be talking, Professor Gilbert will be speaking um, to start with um, about half an hour and um, Marcus will be talking for the last 15 minutes and please do put any questions you have in either the chat or the Q&A and we'll have a good 15 minutes at the end to ask them. So over to you, um, Professor Gilbert, and thank you very much indeed. Great, thank you for the introduction. I'm gonna share my screen. And I'm gonna present my presentation and go into full screen. I hope you can see full screen, yes? So thank you everybody for, for um, coming in to listen to my, my lecture here. Um, and thank you AONM for this invitation because, because it's nice to bring you know, clinicians and scientists and you know, innovators together and like-minded like -minded people together to talk about um, different topics that are affecting Lyme patients. And one of them is this phytochemicals. I'm taking the perspective of the scientific evidence to support the use of phytochemicals for Lyme borreliosis. So I'm really looking specifically at the, at the evidence-based approach to this. And I'll explain why in a second. My, my talk is outlined to introduce evidence-based medicine in the meaning for me and how I apply that to our science and our innovations. We'll have a short discussion of phytochemicals, why we do research Borreliosis, and of course, connecting the two phytochemicals and Borreliosis research and the use of them. And then I like to present and present our current research in phytochemicals and some future prospects. So full disclosure, as already mentioned by Jillian, I am the CEO and co-founder of Tested and the co-inventor of Tickplex and Toxiplex. And other than that, I don't think I have any other statements of disclosures that have influenced this, this lecture. So I like to just bring attention to the definition of evidence-based medicine in, in my mind, how I see, see it. And it's the conscientious, explicit and reasonable use of modern and best research in making decisions about patient care, but it, it, it is really an ensemble of clinical judgment, of course, relevant scientific evidence and the patient's values and preferences. 
all three aspects coming together to provide an evidence-based medicine approach to how we do science and how we help patients. This definition of evidence-based may be different in other countries, but I think that this works well for us and our innovations because we really have the goal of listening to the patients and, and really bringing products forward for the best of, for, to help them and the best products forward to help them. As you probably are aware, so phytochemicals have a long history in actually helping people. They are medicinal plants that are traditionally used all over the world. And usually I like to put this rainbow here because as nutritionists like, like Marcus may mentioned and others, you need to eat the rainbow because they have valuable compounds in them. So very specifically, phytochemicals are non-nutritive plant chemicals that have protective or disease preventative prop properties such as antioxidants and so forth. They may have you know, antimicrobial abilities as we will discuss uh, further, and they are really there to protect the cells by defending them against harmful free radicals. And as we le learn about phytochemicals within this lecture, um, I want to present really the evidence-based approach and why we're doing this because these are the statistics I'd like to um, mention here, what drives us in our research. So every 120 seconds in Europe, someone is being diagnosed with a tick-borne disease. That statistic is every 96 seconds in the United States and every two seconds in China. These, these are facts and these are supported by peer review publications. And also, if you look at here, this world map, these are reported cases okay, of tick-borne diseases. And it's interesting that even some countries can't even report the numbers because they don't have an est established surveillance system. So WHO, WHO, World Health Organization, has actually stated that these numbers are grossly underestimated. But we know that tick-borne diseases are in 80 countries all over the world. And it has been reported that out of these treated patients, there is possibly up to 2 million patients in the United States alone suffering from post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. So it's we have to change these statistics. And after reading a lot of publications, we estimated about five years ago that the global population by 2050 will actually, that have uh, a tick-borne infection will reach 35%. And you will think, no, that's crazy numbers. But actually it was reported last year that we're already seeing 14.5 of the global population already having seen Borrelia, have been infected with Borrelia. So we're not far from this 35% of the global population being infected. And we need to change these numbers because, because if you believe the Center of Disease Control in the United States, up to 20% of treated people will succumb to long-term consequences of, of tick-borne disease. And we need to change those, those numbers. And also patient advocacy groups have testified in court, okay, that it takes 11 different visits, 11 different doctors up to 11 di diagnostic kits and on an average 11 years to get a proper diagnosis. And governments are spending 20 billion euros to manage these patients. And again, these are absolutely solid statistics to really consider and, and to tell us, wake up, we need to help the patients and do better. So this is where we are. So what I did was, a, I did a Google search on PubMed or Google, Google Scholar or MedPub, and I used terms like Borreliosis and phytochemicals or Lyme and phytochemicals, and I got an assortment of articles, and I could find only really 20 peer-reviewed publications with experiments in that publication. I did find a lot of anecdotal accounts, and I, like I said before, I don't want to disregard these anecdotal accounts um, because they are valuable experience. However, I'm really looking at the experiments to support the use, the evidence-based approach also uh, to support the use of phytochemicals in publications. I, have, I was on my search, I was able to discover a bachelor thesis that comments on phytochemicals and Lyme disease and other peer-reviewed publications like the use of reishi mu uh, mushrooms, bee venom, fish oil, and just recently, two weeks ago, a review by Thomas et al. that actually did similar findings, but increased the search to herbs or supplements and Lyme disease. For me, I wanted to use phytochemicals in the strictest context and look at the evidence based to support the use of these phytochemicals in treating Lyme patients. 
So let's begin understanding actually the methods. When I, when I did an intensive summary of all the literature, the 20 articles, I started to notice actually a common method that was being used. And it's usually called bacterial viability say, or back live dead stain, okay, where the scientists or the authors will use two dyes, a green dye, cyber green, to label all cells, or PI dye, propidium iodine dye, dye, iodine dye to actually label dead cells. And I wanted to show you the nature of both of these two dyes inside the cells. So I'm gonna show, uh, show the first PI, propidium iodine movie here, and you will notice the flickering of these Borrelia. This is live cell imaging, bright field microscope. I'll play it again here, and you can see really the Borrelia is moving. These Borrelias are not dead. Unfortunately, this dye will go inside this atypical cell membrane that the Borrelia has. And I would caution interpreting the results of these publications that are solely relying on, on the PI because it is absolutely going in into these cells. If we look at the cyber green dye, you will notice that again, this dye goes into all cells and they are going in and this and the Borrelia is flickering and moving. And this was cell imaging, I'll play it one more time. And you can see they really are moving and flickering around. So again, I, I pay attention to these techniques because I would loosely interpret this data. And for this presentation, I wanted to analyze how many of these 20 articles are using using this bacterial viability say, because if we only use that method, then I would, I would say be cautious with the interpretation of the findings. So this is the first set of publications of the 20 uh, peer reviewed publications on use of phytochemicals to treat Lyme disease or, or actually to kill Borrelia. And you'll notice that the, the pink um, publications here outlined in pink, they are, they may be using PI dye, propitting iodine dye as, as a death marker, but they're also counting the cells. And that's the thing. If they're only solely relying on this, uh, on the cyber green PI, cyber green PI, cyber green PI, I would take caution. And we look at other, the other publications as well. Um, you, see, you can see that a, a lot of these publications still use PI, but then other methods such as using green fluorescent uh, bacteria and spectrometry or counting the cells, or again, subculturing the cells and counting the cells and so forth. So when we're looking at kind of the synopsis of all of these, we have to also consider, you know, these anecdotal accounts and, and yes, respect the anecdotal accounts um, that have been published, not in peer reviewed our, our, our journals, but it's nice that they're attempting to actually bring out their experiences into a publication. Because we have, in doing this search, we have made seen statements like this in the anecdotal uh, context. According to some, the Cowden, Cowden treatment improved acute and chronic Lyme disease syndrome in over 70% of the patients whom he, this clinician, prescribed the full protocol. And based on this anecdotal account of his patients, we, if you dig deeper, you will see that there's actually 12,000 patients under that statement. And that would, would have been such a great article to write up, get it peer reviewed, so that we could actually start off of that as precedence in, in the use of, of phytochemicals in humans. But this was not happened, unfortunately. And even some societies, patient societies, actually recommend this protocol based on anecdotal. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying that we should take caution and try to really approach this as evidence-based because we will have the burden of proof to, to show that, that uh, in peer-reviewed publications, these products are working. And that's the whole point of trying to encourage clinicians, scientists to publish really their work because these 12,000 12, patients that benefited from the counter protocol, that would have been such a profound article for all to read and see and, and utilize, you know, and support further treatments. And so when we look at the in vitro studies, these are the eight in vitro studies that I'm going to share with you in the next few slides. 
And yes, some may be using propitating iodine, but they're using some other methods as well, like subculturing or just really cult culturing the Borrelia when they are in that in, in the presence of the phytochemical. So we'll take a look at some of these that came out. So those eight articles. And when I look at these publications, I'd like to see kind of correlation. How many articles are we seeing that actually support teasel root? Well, we do have articles here really supporting that and sound with sound methods. We also have in Fing, Fing et al, we'll see that name again. In a lot of these publications, they have done work, good work on uh, essential oils and they have noticed or, oregano, cinnamon, bark and clove essential oil, oils have actually killed Borrelia. And also rock rose there and um, two articles here have mentioned this as well, that it's good against Borrelia. We also have a mixture of different um, phytochemicals here in, in this product. And, but if we look at the kind of common attributes, we're seeing black walnut, we're seeing oregano oil, lavender is there, bilberry, milk, um, thistle, and so forth. Garlic is there, grapeseed extract is there as well. And this Feng and Alt again in 2018 reported garlic, allspice, smirgum, and others, uh, others that actually killed the Borrelia. And that's the whole point. Um, as we know, the doxycycline, the recommended treatment protocol, is a, a biostatic drug. It does not kill Borrelia. It, it just stops it from replicating. So when I, when I analyze the phytochemicals and if it's working against the Borrelia, I want to see the death of Borrelia, obviously. And Feng and Ald, again, okay, a great publication here. He has shown that Chinese skull cap, Eastern black walnut, uh, cryptolepsis. I'm sure a lot of these names are familiar for you, for you, but it's really good to show that that there is some really good evidence-based um, um, articles to support the use of these. Japanese not were, not would see warm words, cat's claw, cemento as the trade name is, and Harry Rockrose, again, we're seeing that name again. And I wanted to show you the nature of, of what they do, thing and all. So basically, yes, they're using PI and cyber green, because you can see the green here, okay? But you also can see the red, the PI red, but they're also culturing. So what they do is they take a seven-day stationary growth phase of Borrelia, and they expose it to natural products. And in their case, they exposed it for seven days. And then they took a sample and grew that, subcultured it in fresh media outside, you know, the pressure of the phytochemical and to see if it was going, if the burley was going to grow. And, and here is just a microscope um, image of green and red. Green is the Borrelia, cyber green, all the cells there and red is supposed to be the dead. But as we know, we don't want to interpret the red. So let's just focus on the green. And what I do here, there's a reason why I'm bringing up these images, but the idea is to compare, like in here, the cryptolepsis and other compounds at different concentration, like black walnut, cat's claw, knotweed, and compare it with the controls. So drug-free control here, we see growth, doxycycline, you see it here at a very low concentration, five micrograms per milliliter, you see all cells there. And then you see a drop in the green. It's a drop in the green single meaning drop of cells. So you can really see that cryptolysis is the best one out of all these compounds to have an effect on Borrelia. And you can see that the, the, the number um, of cells in this frame is a lot less than the, than the drug-free control. And it's interesting though, there's, with microscopy imaging, just like this, it's very subjective. Like if we take this Chinese skull cap and compare it to the drug-free control, it may be very difficult to actually uh, see the difference between the green here. And obviously they're saying that there is good death, but we're not really seeing the blue, or sorry, the, the, the red from the propidium iodine. So this is what I wanna say that these images are very subjective, but uh, when they quantitate this and see if they're growing, then you can see you see that they're not supposed to grow if they're killing the cell. But the drop in cell uh, amount of Borrelia is indicative that there is some effect of these compounds on, on the Borrelia. And he did the same thing with, with some other compounds that have been reported in the literature before, like stevia and dro dro and, and colloidal silver and this ask us. And I just wanted to say that his comments were from the paper that they didn't show significant activity against their stationary phase 
okay, or growing Borrelia in this study. And I wanted to make sure and, and just focus your attention on the, on the term stationary phase. This previous data was on stationary phase. So they're not taking the logarithmic growth Borrelia, but they're really taking the plateau Borrelia on the top and indicating that that could be those, that's where those kind of like persisters may, may actually see in the plateau of the growth. So my point is here on the stationary phase, very little effect of these, of these compounds or no comp or no effects of these compounds against the Borrelia. But that was this one study and other people may have obviously reported other findings. And that's the whole point that we need to have more studies to make sure that we can validate these methods and have reproducible findings on these compounds. But there is great, there is great work to extend the other methods uh, on the use in analyzing actually uh, the death of Borrelia by, by these phytochemicals. And one of the methods here is this wa water soluble tetrazoleum salt that is actually changed into a uh, formazin dye, okay, in living cells. So if the cells are living in the exposure of phytochemicals, they'll have more dye within the cell. And you can see here, the really the cytotoxic effect of DE. So this means this uh, Dipsascus extract, okay? And they actually isolated the polyphenolic fractions called DP2, DP7, here uh, below to see if those those extracted um, uh, uh, compounds could actually kill more so the Borrelia than their than the DDE compound, and you can really see the cytotoxic effect because they have lower lower of uh, the formazin dye here in the viable cells. So this is this is nice and encouraging, and other data to support by other authors to support that wild teasel is is definitely indeed uh, causing cytotoxic effects on the Borrelia. So this was really great in, to see this. And I talked about a current review that came out about two weeks ago from Thomas et al. And I wanted to show you that there are a lot of, like I mentioned, anecdotal and peer review publications to support many common, common phytochemicals in the use of, of uh, um, killing Borrelia, so anti-Borrelia effects. Um, and generally, a lot of these comments can have antibacterial effects. A lot of these are known to have anti-inflammatory effects. And anecdotally, or in some, some comments in some books, they have stated that, that uh, these compounds do, do provide uh, usefulness in actually treating Lyme symptoms. And I put these red arrows here because, because if we see a certain compounds that are reproducible, reproducible in different uh, scientific articles, then I feel comfortable that, um, that these compounds are really evidence-based uh, to be used for Lyme disease patients. And the thing is, is that all the, all the publications that I have mentioned to you are in vitro system at the moment. And, and within even this table here, I have uh, uh, found that actually they missed these two publications, Harry Rock Rose and Black Walnut as compounds or phytochemicals when they did their search. So I'm not saying that peer review publications are all exclusive, but at least if we see reproducible methods being demonstrating the same thing, then I think this is, this is promising and a very good lead to actually clinical trials because Fundamentally, what we need to do when we're looking at phytochemicals or any drugs or any kind of treatment to help patients, we have to provide some evidence, like I said, evidence-based approach. And it usually starts with the preclinicals or the in vitro studies that all the studies that I just showed you are in vitro studies. Up to this point, I could not found, find a peer-reviewed human clinical study on the usage solely of, phyto, of phytochemicals in Lyme patients. And maybe this is, this is the... Um, more difficult way of approaching it because, because uh, since we don't have any, we need more studies and clinical studies, but there is uh, a lot of anecdotal um, experiences and we just need to move those into a peer reviewed publication so that others can benefit from it and patients can benefit more from, from this kind of evidence-based approach into providing, providing uh, the solutions of treating Lyme, Lyme patients. So we need more studies and clinical studies. We even animal studies, there are no animal studies on phytochemicals, the use of phytochemicals in treating a burly infection. But I'm, I'm sure in the near future, we will see more and more of, uh, of clinical studies in the studies with humans. So 
Um, so I wanted to present to you just our research in the next few minutes here. And we wanted to, like, we have an interest in improving the patient's life. So of course, we're interested in finding compounds that that could, you know, affect the Borrelia. And for the main kind of uh, experiments that we do is we do the MIC, which is the minimum initial concentration assay. So that's the lowest concentration that will inhibit visible growth visible growth, seeing it or quantifying it. And then we actually support the mix with the MBC, which is the minimum bactericidal death assay. So does it really kill the Borrelia? So we cannot subculture any Borrelia once the Borrelia has been treated with the phytochemical. And then of course, we like to know the effectiveness of the quickness of death. So we do a death curve analysis. And then we, of course, we wanna see any possible synergetic effects. So we do a checkerboard method uh, to see if we can lessen the, the usage of antibiotics and replace it with the phytochemicals. And just to show you our methods, we use a green fluorescent, so it's enhanced green fluorescent protein within a Borrelia. And you can see it here in, this, in the spear kit structure, the blebs loops of the Borrelia, also round bodies and biofilm. So it's really easy for us to visually see the green that's within the Borrelia. And DIC is this differential interface contrast, so we can see the morphology of the Borrelia as well. And of course, the DNA stains, the stains that go inside, like ethidium bromide, it goes inside uh, dead cells, or propionium iodine goes in cells, supposed to go in cells, dead cells, but we already know that this PI goes inside living cells. So we tend not to use the PI or ethidium bromide in our, in our experiments, but we see a drop of green fluorescent protein, protein in our studies. So this is what we're seeing here. We're looking at the relative fluorescent from the green fluorescent protein in the Borrelia. So if it's undergoing death, the plasma membrane of the Borrelia will open up and the green fluorescent will go out into the environment. So the Borrelia is dying. It's not, it has a compromised cell membrane and it will die. And we look, took different concentrations that have advanced formula of a phytochemical. And we saw that the MIC, which is one to 10 dilution here actually I uh, showed this uh, minimum initial concentration to say. We actually took, after 96 hours, took that and subcultured it and for three weeks to get the minimum bacterial death assay, and it supported the MIC of 1 to 10. We also used a libosomal formula of this bio, uh, phytochemical, and we saw that actually we can delete it or dilute it more further into 1 to 25 dilution and as seen in this green. And again, after 96 hours treatment of the Borrelia, we subcultured it and looked at the relative fluorescence or saw that there, there was no, uh, no more growth of the Borrelia. So we could confirm that the MIC is one to 25. We also did the same experiments on round bodies. So we induced round bodies and then exposed them uh, for 96 hours in this advanced formula of phytochemicals as well as the liposomal form formula, and we noticed that both of the MICs is 1 to 50. So the round bodies are more susceptible to, to the uh, phytochemicals in this study. And the MD, MBDs uh, confirm the MICs. So 1 to 5, or sorry, 1 to 50 dilution was the, the minimum initial concentration that, that actually uh, killed the Borrelia. And this was really interesting. Both formulas were also taken into death rates, and we saw actually a really significant drop okay, in the cell number even after 10 minutes. It fluctuated a little bit, of course, as the, as the minutes passed, but there was, the effect was quite immediate. And then we, we went and we put them in a synergetic uh, so this checkerboard experiments where we where it, the phytochemical was in the presence of doxycycline, a biostatic drug, okay, and you can see if the Borrelia was growing, which is yes, and if the Borrelia was not growing, it's no. So you can, and so this table basically shows you that uh, with synergetic uh, compound like in the presence of doxycycline, these phytochemicals were able to drop the dose of doxycycline down quite quite considerably. And so you don't need to use quite harsh treatment protocols with doxy in the presence of phytochemicals. And I mentioned to you earlier that there was no clinical studies or human studies that are peer reviewed, but, but there are studies that are being published that uses phytochemicals in the presence of other, other um, uh, drugs or supplements such as Horowitz has published two clinical trials 
that in his patients, he uses antibiotics or other phytochemicals, such as, you know, biocidins, uh, stevia and oregano oil. And so that's the, the point, even in, with the synergetic effect, he has shown that these compounds are at least helping in the, in the, in the patients. So when we start our path to analyze actually compounds, like in this case, the phytobox, which Marcus is going to be talking about, we do these quick studies to see if there's a drop in cell count compared to the controls. So basically, again, we put 2 million cells um, under the microscope and we treat it with the Phytobox 1 here or Phytobox 4, Phytobox 3 or Phytobox 6, or we have the cell control or we really have hydrogen peroxide, which definitely does kill to barely a low concentration. And then we want to see the drop in cells. So this is why we have the phase contrast images here. We could have used DIC, differential interface contrast images, but phase was good for us at this moment. We could quantify the green fluorescence, the drop in cells, compare it to this, to the uh, cells without any treatment. But you can really see that a lot of these fighter box compounds, like, well, these four, one, four, uh, three, and six, absolutely has a drop in uh, fluorescence single. And this is was really promising because because we are approached a lot about different uh, phytochemicals or herbal supplements. Can you test this in the Borrelia? Well, we do this, this quick study to really see if it's worthwhile to bring this into a larger in vitro study. And in, in this case, absolutely, this is really encouraging that we should bring this into the MIC MBTs, the death analysis and the synergetic checkerboard experiments to really give this evidence-based approach. And also this can give preliminary data to clinical studies, which I believe Marcus will talk about a little bit later too. So this is really exciting for us. And I think the take home message is really that we need studies, we need in vitro studies, we also need clinical studies. And and don't be discouraged if you think the clinical studies are hard to do, or you may even have just some really great cases based on your on your experience in use, utilizing different phytochemicals. And it's very easy to put these into into a case study. So come up, come and approach us, and we'll be willing to help you do this. So I like to finish this, and I'll bring give the floor over to actually Marcus, and then we'll take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Leona. So I just uh, open my screen, just a second. Okay, so I hope everyone can uh, can see my screen. And um, yeah, so first of all, um, I wanna say thank you, Jillian, for the introduction. And also thank you, Leona, um, for, your, for your great lecture. Um, so it's always really, really inspiring to, to listen to you and, um, I'm really, really glad that we work alongside, and um, I'm yeah, just proud that we are kind of kind of colleagues, and um, that you're really motivating everyone to do more research, as it is really, really necessary. And um, in my mind, you're really the the one um, who is able to to motivate everyone, also everyone who's listening here to participate or um, maybe do their their own uh, small clinical trials in case there are doctors among us. Um, listening today, so um, thank you, thank you for your presentation. Um, yeah, so um, Phytobox. Um, well, um, as Jane already mentioned, my name is Marcus. I'm CEO of Phytobox. And um, what is uh, what is Phytobox, and um, what what do we do? Um, so, um, who we are? Um, we are um, we are Wolfgang and and Marcus. Um, we founded Phytobox actually in in 2018. Um, in the beginning, just as an idea. Um, so we both were working um, actively with, uh, with Lyme patients since uh, 2010. And um, we were supporting Lyme patients in nutritional consultations, rehab training. Um, during this time, we realized um, also how important it actually is for patients suffering from Lyme disease, um, that it's not just work um, alongside the patient, and it's a work with the patient. That every patient has several struggles um, with treatment plans, with medications, um, with supportive treatments. And um, out of all of those struggles from patients, um, we, yeah, finally developed our not really to say our own idea because it's not our own idea. Um, this idea is across the world. Everyone, um, every doctor who 
really treats Lyme disease, wants to support um, his patients in the best uh, possible way. And that's the same what we try to do with Phytobox. And um, out of this idea, we, um, we actually started developing several products to support the immune system um, for patients with uh, chronic diseases. So um, in different stages, um, different, different conditions, different symptoms, different syndromes. And um, so, so far, that's, uh, that's who we are in, in Phytobox. Um, how do we kind of develop a Phytobox? Um, so down in the picture, you see um, several Phytoboxes. And um, for all of them, it's the same principle of, of how, we, how we develop a Phytobox. So first of all, as um, Leona just mentioned, um, <laughs> like in her presentation, most important is research. If you don't have if you don't have research, if you don't have knowledge about um, the um, the pathways um, of the of the bacteria, if you don't have um, knowledge about the impact of the bacteria or anything, you 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 won't find a cure or you won't find um, the right support. So what we do upfront um, before developing a phyto box or a single phyto box is actually we are checking: is there any research available? Um, is there maybe um, some, some research available for in vitro effects on antiviral or antibacterial effects? As we just heard from Leona, there is a few, uh, or there are a few um, studies available. There's a little bit of research done, but actually, um, yeah, not, not that much. So we rather have to, to look sometimes for um, different um, ways to, to find the right compound for, for the phytobox. So um, um, checking about the pathways. So, um, like what does um, the, uh, the, uh, the interleukins or the cytokines um, being produced um, inhibit? Um, what will block the, the signaling pathways like chrome sensing and so on? And um, so this is like the basement of every fighter box. We need to have some, um, some proper research done um, which ingredient um, will actually suit the, um, the, uh, the aim which we, which we have for, for the box. Second step um, in developing a fighter box is actually the marketability test. Means um, that we check for the novel food status, that we check for the toxicity of, um, of each compound, that we check for effective dosages. Um, I mean, well, we have different treatment options. Homeopathic uh, treatment um, um, is also a really, really good option, but in our cases, actually it is um, like we want to have a proper dosage um, so um, um, to to really get the effect of um, of the fighter box which we which we produce. Um, on the on the last point is actually the consumer and practitioner safety, and especially for sure every um, patient taking taking a fighter box need to be safe um, while while taking the fighter box. Um, you don't want to experience any severe side reactions or anything. So that is really really important. But it's also really important to take care about the practitioner safety. I mean, we all know how difficult it is to treat Lyme disease. When you check out Norway, um, like dozens of doctors lost their license because they, they treated like a Lyme disease. Um, same happens to practitioners in Australia. We saw in Leona's presentation, we have zero reported cases of Lyme disease in Australia. Well, Lyme disease officially doesn't exist in, in Australia, but still um, there are Lyme patients and there are doctors treating it. And um, they are actively treating it, and uh, they sometimes lose their license. So it is really, really important that um, when a practitioner treats a Lyme disease patient, that he is safe in his products, which he recommends um, to the to the patient. So that he doesn't recommend anything what's not um, supposed to be on the market in this um, in this individual country. So we really need to check for those novel food statuses if it's allowed to sell. Um, to recommend a certain product, a certain ingredient, a certain raw material in a certain country. So um, this is also really, really important in the fighter box development. Um, third point of the fighter box development is um, actually the um, the search for the <clears throat> the search for the suitable raw material and um, also the raw material supplier. So um, once we found uh, a suitable raw material and um, also a supplier. We run several laboratory tests, so like for mycotoxins, toxicity, heavy metals, um, aluminum, um, which is quite often overseen um, um, in in those in those tests. And last but not least, um, also really important for us, the Galenix investigation. 
we develop supplements without any additives, without fillers, without coagulants, without flow or release agents. So it is important that all the um, single ingredients also um, yeah, fit, fit together. <clears throat> to give you a small inside views in some of the supplements um, and in some of the actually fighter boxes. So let's uh, start with, uh, with fighter box one. <laughs> it's actually the first one in the list and also specially designed to uh, support the immune system um, for patients having Lyme disease. Um, fighter box one contains uh, monolaurin and, um, and bicalyin. Um, so to mention, monolaurin is one of the few um, yeah, um, ingredients or compounds where we actually have some, um, some valid data. I mean, we don't have many um, peer-reviewed studies, but we do have a few, like um, a pretty new one um, from 2020. Um, it's actually not really related to Lyme disease, but it's actually uh, related to COVID-19. And there it's mentioned um, that monolaurine, as a bioactive lipid um, from medium chain fatty acid, um, has a broad spectrum um, as an antibacterial, boosts the immune system and acts as a, an, an additional antiviral. So um, even if you don't have many studies, if you, if you closely look, um, there are a few available. Also, um, the monolaurine and also the bicalin, which is um, contained in the, in the fighter box one, is mentioned as the most effective antimicrobial compound against all morphological forms of the two tested Borrelia species. Um, this study was, um, was done as an in vitro evalu evaluation of an antibacterial activity of phytochemicals and micronutrients against Borrelia burgdorferi and Borrelia garinii. There are many more um, yeah, studies or research actually available for, for monolarine, and, um, but I don't want to go through all of those um, research. Um, the presentation will be available afterwards um, for your review, so you can, uh, you can have a look um, on uh, the single effects of, uh, of monolaurin all by yourself. Um, <laughs> this is just uh, list one. Um, also, all of those studies are listed in our study brochure, um, which are also available through AONM. So in case you are really interested in uh, reading through all studies and research, which is available um, for each spider box, well, um, just uh, get in touch with AONM and um, and ask for the for the study brochure. Um, another page of, uh, of reference for for the use of monolaurin and uh, why it's actually in uh, in our um, first product on the fighter box one. And um, <clears throat> bicalin um, as second um, important ingredient. And Professor Gilbert already highlighted uh, highlighted it in the study from. Um, Bang at all in, in, in the study in I think it was 2018 um, that scutellaria bicalensis was one of the several herbs that have strong activity uh, have a stronger activity than actually doxycycline or um, several anti uh, other uh, antimicrobials um, as well as only bicalaine and monolaurine applied at the same concentrations um, were effective in reducing biofilms formed by Borrelia. This is also really, really important, as we just heard also from uh, Professor Gilbert. Um, it is uh, treating Borrelia is not just about treating the spirochete, it's especially a, um, also about the treatment of the biofilms of the pleuromorphic forms. And um, also in, in these regards, we have with a, a monolaurine and with a bicalin actually a great um, supportive help. References available also for the um, for the bicalin um, again available in the study brochure, um, which is available through AONM. Spiderbox two, um, well, um, we all knew um, probably. Described in ingredients from Stephen Buhner. So it um, contains Andrographis paniculata, it contains uh, Chinese cat's claw, Japanese knotweed, um, but also grapefruit seed extract. And um, 
Stephen Buhner actually found in his research that especially andrographis is perhaps the best primary herb to address Lyme disease. It is an antispirochetal, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, an immune stimulant, and much more. And this research also showed that resveratrol and cat's claw are among the best herbs for especially neuroborreliosis. And this is also how um, actually the Phytobox 2 is designed. It is especially um, supportive of the immune system for neuroborreliosis and neuropathic disorders. <laughs> Phytobox 3, we just mentioned it. Um, so pleomorphic forms are really, really important when talking about the treatment um, of, of Lyme disease. And um, so Phytobox 3 is actually um, a herbal supplement to support us in the in the breakdown um, of the round body forms of the cystic forms of biofilms of the pleuromorphic forms from Borrelia um, but it also helps us in detoxification and um, purification. So um, Professor Gilbert did a great uh, research study really on all of those pleuromorphic forms and showed their prevalence also um, actually designed a great uh, test to to check for all those um, pleomorphic forms called a tick flex, um, which is a, actually the only available test also to uh, to detect those pleomorphic forms uh, in IgM, um, but also in IgG. And so to see if you have um, chronic, um, yeah, a chronic stage of, um, of Borrelia, of a Borrelia infection in your, in your system. Um, same again, um, like um, for for all the other fighter boxes, the references are available in the um, in the study brochure, which is available through A and M. On the right hand side in the pictures, you see actually a biofilm um, um, produced from Borrelia, um, looking pretty similar to an Alzheimer plug, um, but actually in this case, it is um, um, a biofilm of Borrelia, and um, in the picture in the, uh, yeah in the down right corner, there we see the pleomorphic forms of, of Borrelia. To mention one, uh, one other box, um, not directly related to, uh, to the support of the immune system in, um, uh, in patients with, with Lyme disease, it's uh, a rather support of the immune system in cytokine storms. Um, every Lyme patient probably experienced at least once um, a really massive Herxheimer reaction. Um, and Sometimes, um, in case of Herxheimer reaction are completely overwhelming, the system are completely overwhelming you, um, you need to stop treatment, you need to reduce treatment, and that's actually um, not what you want as a patient. You want to continue your treatment, you want to, uh, you want to go forward and don't make a break after already one, two weeks or whatever. So um, we designed the Phytobox 7 especially to release those cytokine storms um, containing astaxanthin, licorice root, shiitake, and black cumin to really reduce those cytokine reactions to inhibit um, um, TNF-alpha, interleukin-1 uh, beta, and uh, different other cytokines. Usage of Phytobox. Um, we know that sometimes taking supplements and, um, and the whole treatment is difficult. Um, it's not just difficult; it's it's overwhelming. Sometimes you have dozens of supplements. You have to you have to count um, hundreds of drops every single day. So, uh, what we try actually with uh, with Spider Box is not just um, offering a one more solution. It is actually um, offering a solution um, based on the combination uh, with already existing um, protocols, with already existing products. Um, like we see here in the, um, on, the, on the left side, we have a sample protocol um, for, for Borrelia, for Lyme disease. Um, we're using BioDisrupt um, to break down the, to break down the, the pleomorphic forms. Um, the supplements um, designed from and created by research nutritionists. One great product, we don't have to invent um, it a second time or just copy and paste it, but um, it is important for us and it's also our goal to uh, to make the phyto boxes um, combinable with, with other um, existing treatment options, with school medical treatments, with other um, alternative protocols, with other options. So it is really, really important for us to see phyto box. It can be taken as a standalone treatment, but it also is possible to take um, in a combination with different other treatments. And it's not all about the pathogen. As you know, it's about the immune system, taking transfer factors, also from research nutritionists, 
um, great stuff, like one of the best which we have experienced um, ever. So um, it is about the immune support. It is about a symptomatic support. It is about managing the inflammations, talking about the three eyes. It's not just the infection. It is the inflammation and the immune support. Those three eyes need to be fixed for every single patient. And we try to make it easy for everyone. Um, treatment and suffering is sometimes hard enough. So what we try is really trying to make it easy and simple for everyone so that you will manage to um, follow your red line through the treatment and um, will be able to, to keep up doing what you're doing and in the way back um, to, to yeah achieving your health. Um, another sample protocol. So um, what we designed is actually a complete protocol for different symptoms, syndromes, indications, pathogens. Um, and those are just a few examples. The full protocol book is also available, again, through AONM. Um, it is possible to combine uh, different, uh, different protocols. Um, as we see here, um, a sample protocol for uh, one of the most common co-infections from Lyme disease, Bartonella, cat scratch disease. Um, we find here, uh, for example, um, another another um, product, like Tangarana from um, Traumatics, um, Lecode did lots of work on, on those products. And um, this is just to show you that you can combine the phytoboxes with different other treatments, different other uh, medications, um, but again, can be also taken as standalone treatment. Um, it's not just about the bacteria, it's also about the viruses, and we will probably have a separate um, an individual session about um, treatment and support of the immune system um, in, in viral infections. So here we have a protocol on um, for, for enteroviruses using the Phytobox 1 and Phytobox 11 um, for the support of the pathogens. Um, on the right side, we have the herpesberry, and we have a protocol for the herpesberry day. Um, so basically covering the complete group, uh, herpes simplex 1, 2, but also EBV, varicella, zoster, cytomegalo, HHV6, HHV7. Last but not least, well, <laughs> what makes us special? Um, <laughs> we, um, Spiderbox is, um, is uh, possible to, um, to be actually uh, a combination or an effectful combination um, for every individual patient. And this is what we try to achieve. Every patient is individual. So, Every patient is unique and you need to have a unique option for every individual patient. So, and this is what we, what we try to, to do with, with, uh, with Phytobox. So um, really find this unique option every, every patient um, needs to have in the end. Phytobox is possible as a standalone treatment or in combination with uh, school medical treatments or um, other alternative treatment options as just mentioned. Um, we have the benefit of, of a capsule-based principle. Um, with not many um, other um, producers of, of herbal supportive supplements have. Um, so that's a benefit. We have exact dosages. Um, you can, um, it's not just, sometimes you have a small drop, sometimes you have a big drop, uh, you, you have a bigger drop. Um, so you um, can't always like really demand on this, on this dosage which you take, but with a capsule-based principle, you do. Um, we don't have any alcohol. Um, in our in our fighter box products, it means it's suitable for children. Um, capsules can be opened up, also mixed uh, mixed um, in um, in just some water if you have problems swallowing capsules or whatsoever. And it can also be taken uh, for patients uh, with conditions in which tincture ba tinctures based on alcohol, are, for example, prohibited. We I mentioned um, in the early beginning the pureness and quality um, of the of the fighter box products. So um, we don't have any unnecessary fillers, any colorants, any coagulants or whatsoever inside. Um, we have short transportation times of raw ingredients. Uh, we just heard in the in a, um, latest webinar from uh, from Kunal Gag from Tested about um, about the importance of mycotoxins. And if you have long transportation times of, of raw materials, well, <laughs> think about all the mycotoxins. Um, think about uh, like the bad environment in the containers and so on. If the raw materials haven't been dried enough, whatsoever. So short transportation times really really important. Um, we do uh, perform constant laboratory controls on mycotoxins, on heavy metals, um, other toxic met uh, metals such as aluminum, and um, we yeah. Last but not least, um, 
try to never stop evolving. And um, in case we do, well, please let us know so we can uh, we can restart again. And um, Fighterbox is, as Julian just just mentioned in the beginning, it started as an idea to support patients, and um, there is still the idea behind to find the right support for everyone. So, um, in case you have any um, feedback for us um, or anything just let us know so we can um yeah include your ideas into our idea um to make it yeah really to make it uh, the idea of all of us to help everyone and to yeah support everyone as good as we can Fighterbox is uh, <laughs> sorry <laughs> one more last one um now available in the uk um aonm um is our partner for the uk and um, but also ireland so um, Fighterbox workbook and also study brochure is available through AONM and um, you can check out the Fighterbox products as well in, in, at their website. Uh, you can drop them an email or give them a ring um, for further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus, and also um, Professor Gilbert. Fantastic presentations, very interesting. And I know that um, Marcus, we are able to contact you if we have any questions about specific, um, you know, protocols for patients. That's always extremely helpful. So uh, let's go on to the questions because we've had quite a few. Um, thank you for answering some of them already, <laughs> Professor Gilbert. Um, one that's very interesting, and I don't know which of you wants to answer the first, is that we've been talking about Borrelia in general, but of course there are lots of different species, whether it's Garini or Afzeli or Miyamoto or whatever. Um, does that seem to matter in the um, studies that you've looked at, um, uh, Professor Gilbert, or in the uh, development of your products, Marcus? Do you want to go first, Marcus? Um, yeah, well, um, I can. Um, well, they are always, um, also especially since since we don't use just a product uh, based on a, on a single compound, we always have um, cross reactions. We always cover more than one species, but actually, um, we can't say that we that we're really covering all the species. I mean, um, we just basically can't. Um, sometimes we see the the, the clinical effect um, from from doctors and get uh, get their get their feedback from patients who were who were treated with uh, with a, with a product. But as we don't have enough data, as we as there is not enough research done, we can't just say well. Um, there's one box working for for all the species. We we simply can't, and um, unfortunately. So I yeah. wish we, could, but yeah. yeah. And and I concur. And it's a good point to look when you're reading the the peer reviewed um, publications to really see how many species they use, um, or even to their legacy papers as well to see if there are any species. But but I do know that just by the experience of working with with Borrelia garini, Borrelia absolutely, and uh, Really, Bredorvery since since so stricto group groups, those three species tend to behave the same in a lot of these products. Um, so so we have decided to use um, a more amicable um, kind of friendly way of actually uh, quantifying the death, uh, and that's the green fluorescent proteins, with which actually has an in, a very similar um, outer surface membrane proteins in in structure and plasmids as as the parent form. So. So it's it's a very good question, and I think that you would be safe to read those studies to see if they have uh, did the experience in other species, but feel confident that it would be definitely uh, affecting at least those three species that I have mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Also, a question to you, Professor Gilbert. I think um, here uh, someone asked whether the slide showing the various green subcultures. Hmm was actually showing that various um, herbal treatments were significantly more effective than doxycycline. That's true, because as I mentioned already, doxycycline is a, a biostatic compound, which means that it does not kill the Borrelia. So it will only stop replication of the Borrelia and rely on the host immune system to, to uh, take care of the Borrelia. So it will not kill. So you will see a lot of these compounds actually killing the Borrelia, which is great, which is the whole purpose of us meeting here today. So that's that's good. Thank you. And um, when observing Borrelia in patients with Lyme, do you also see many other co-infections such as Bartonella? Again, you know, addressed to both of you. 
Perhaps, Marcus, you could mention that first, though. Yeah. Whether co-infections are very common, too? Well, <laughs> always. Um, so we, I haven't experienced, well, maybe maybe in the really, really early beginning, so like in 2010, 2011, but there we were just thinking about Lyme. We we're not thinking about co-infections or anything. So there we experienced uh, experienced some, some patients with just, uh, with just Lyme. But, um now and um, the status right now um, I am in with the knowledge there's no patient without any co-infection and it might just be some opportunistic infections which have been reactivated um, due to due to um, the uh, the impact of Borrelia on the immune system but there is no um, no patient without uh, without co-infections so yeah. it might be but haven't experienced one in in years we wanted to sort of delineate what we were talking about today, but uh, definitely we must expand this, don't you think, Professor Gilbert, as well, to talking about Bartonella and Babesia and the other co-infections. Yeah. That would be so fascinating. Yeah, we had this catch take beryllium friends <laughs> in the, that was coming from Cornell, and he he gave a great uh, kind of analysis of, of the test results we're seeing. And it, there's an 85% chance that a Lyme patient will have a co-infection. 85% chance, and this has been published. It's it's high. It's really, really high. Yeah. And um, perhaps addressed to you, um, Marcus, again, are there any side effects of phytochemicals? I know you talked about the safety, but that was a question that came up. Mm -hmm. So, well, um, as every um, product you, you can take, um, also phytochemicals might have some side effects. They are usually not as far not as severe as uh, with, uh, with antibiotics or anything, but I think also Leona already answered the question in chat great. Um, so there is a nice overview from Thompson et al. Um, 20, uh, 2023. Um, there is a table um, titled uh, Common Drug Drug Interactions of Both Compounds Commonly um, that Patients Use for Lyme Disease. Um, and uh, this actually covers most of the, um, of the um, yeah, herbs being used and uh, support of Lyme, um, of Lyme patients, and they see possible side effects, but again, they're really, really rare, and usually um, also the, the expected Herxheimer reactions are way lower um, while taking an antibiotic treatment, and they can be managed much, much better as you're um, more free to, uh, to actually support your detox and so on while being on antibiotics. You don't want to detox too heavily, otherwise you might detox the antibiotics. Uh, from the system so but being on a herbal treatment um, you will have uh, the increased possibility to, to go also for a proper detox to really manage the Herxheimer reactions much much better to um, manage the, the cytokine reactions um, way better than um, actually being being on antibiotics. Super thank you and um, thanks uh, Professor Gilbert for putting that in the um, Q&A. Perhaps you could put that at the beginning of your Phytobox handbook, Marcus, that link yeah. so that uh, practitioners have that available. That's really useful. Um, one practitioner here has written that bakelin is a very interesting compound that protects against lipid peroxidation by increasing the genetic expression of um, various other pathways. Um, thank you. And also that um, powderalco, which you haven't mentioned yet, uh, Marcus, is a a great compound that um, upregulates various uh, different other, um, like NQ01 yeah. here. I don't know, is, is that something that you've come across, either of you, in your research? How darko? It's more for viruses, perhaps, but um, yeah. do you find that to be antibacterial as well? I haven't, I haven't used it for a purpose, but um, an antiviral purpose, it's described and also, um, well, haven't been mentioned um, in this um, in this session, but yeah, it's it's a good compound, especially in those regards. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Also, the number of articles over the last three years that have come up finding that many of these um, phytochemicals are effective against COVID, SARS-CoV-2 as well. Yeah, mm. and something that I've been researching a lot recently is how part of that action appears to be their ability to drive um, um, mitophagy and autophagy. In other words, mm -hmm. to help with the, uh, you know, the clearance of cell debris, yeah. which of course we're getting a lot with this recent infection, but of course with Borrelia as well, and and the mitochondria too are suffering, 
Is that yep. something you, you've come across as well, um, Professor Gilbert? I think I think that having these compounds that affect those pathways to boost those pathways is the way forward for uh, for even society, maybe some a lot of hurt reactions and side effects of even just even you know pharmaceuticals. So so it's very interesting um, pathways. And again, we I keep saying we, we need more studies, but there are some really good um, uh, how do I say compounds to to enhance those? Uh, so it might be worthwhile to looking into into those those ones that do indeed induce autophagy and metophagy because yes. it's important for us. So yeah, yes. Well, thank you so much for that um, offer you made, uh, Professor Gilbert, of actually supporting us therapists in uh, gathering our yeah. experience into studies. So we'll definitely take you up on that. Okay. Great. And uh, perhaps together with Marcus, uh, build a bit of a database yeah. there. Um, yeah. Just to uh, mention uh, at the end, um, of course, thank you both very, very much. And I'll say that again in a moment, but I'd just like to pull up the screen to share the fact that um, there is a big conference on chronic pathologies being held in Germany, but it'll also be virtual um, from the 15th to the 17th of September by Armin Labs, uh, many others will be participating. In fact, um, I'll just scroll down if I can, I don't know, to some of the speakers, uh, just wonderful speakers, including Dr. <laughs> Professor Gilbert, of course, Armin Schwarzbach, I've got too much covering my screen here. Um, Dr. Paul de Zadler, who's um, um, the brains behind some of those other products that you mentioned, Marcus, and uh, Dr. Klinghardt, and many others. There are about 20 speakers, so I won't scroll through them all. And then um, there is also um, a number of different um, conferences coming up because of it being Lyme Awareness Month. For example, in Ireland, TikTok is taking place near Dublin on the 27th of um, May. And um, Dr. Schwarzbach and Professor Jack Lambert, who spoke to us recently twice uh, brilliantly on long COVID and Lyme, will be there giving talks. And I believe. Um, Professor Gilbert will be there as well as at the um, crypto um, infections conference in Ireland again, but also um, virtual. That's taking place um, in June on the 17th and 18th. And then um, AONM will have a number of different um, webinars going forward, more than we usually have because of it being Lyme Awareness Month. So we've got Professor Robert Bransfield and Dr. Joseph Jemsek speaking on the 23rd of May. That's next Tuesday. And they'll be talking about the convergence of two pandemics, Lyme disease and COVID-19. Dr. Schwarzbach will be speaking on the 31st of May about the occurrence, uh, co-occurrence really of, of Lyme and co-infections over the pandemic. And Julia Behrens will be talking about her new book, Lost in Lyme, the therapeutic use of plants in supporting um, patients with Lyme disease on the 6th of June. And so um, many, many webinars, very exciting as well as um, events coming up. We do also have Dr. Sarah Myhill speaking on this 20th of June about the benefits of oxygen which applies right across the board, really. So um, it, the questions have come up as to whether this is being recorded and will be available afterwards. Yes, absolutely. And the speakers have very kindly allowed us to um, make their PowerPoints available too. So that will just take a few days and then it'll all be up on the website. So thank you very much, everyone, for being there. Thank you, speakers, Professor Gilbert and Marcus, very, very much indeed for your tremendous uh, presentations and answering all the questions and You're um very well welcome and uh, i just sorry julian um i just had two other questions in the chat um about the availability in the us so we're currently actually working on the fda registration of our fighter boxes um and uh, as soon as this one is completed fighter box uh, will also be available in the us uh, we are also in talks already with a distributor over there but fda registration needs to be completed uh, from our side for patients and practitioner safety. Yes, thank you. And then there are a few questions about whether we could send the workbook out to everybody. I think probably you'll be advising that we um, restrict that to pr practitioners only, Marcus, the, the workbook itself.
but absolutely that is available from AONM. So please just do send in a quick um, request or maybe on a practitioner only website, we'll make that available together with the leaflet, which is a more succinct um, some, you know, summary of what to use for the different infections. And um, thank you so much again. So thank you. So hopefully next Tuesday with uh, Professor Bransfield and Dr. Jemsek. Great. Thank Bye. you, Julie. Bye -bye. Thank you, guys. Bye.